So welcome everyone to this prevention collaborative webinar. Um, my name is Lindsay McLean. Um, I'm a senior associate with the uh, Prevention Collaborative and also a lecturer at the University of Sussex uh, based in Brighton in the UK. Um, just to say a few words about the collaborative and then I'm going to introduce our speakers for this exciting webinar today. So for those of you who um, are not familiar with the Prevention Collaborative, um, we're a global network that we, we set up about three years ago. And our mission is very much um, to collaborate with others in the violence prevention field to improve the quality of evidence-based programming in the field um, from, a, from a sort of feminist perspective. So we're a network of activists and practitioners and researchers, and we partner with various local organizations um, basically to support them with prevention programming. And we also do some sort of synthesis work on getting kind of evidence uh, into action. And we particularly aim at practitioners and also about elevating practitioner experiences. So you can go to our website if you want to learn a bit more, but that's a brief introduction to the collaborative. So today I'm really excited to um, be moderating this webinar which is about the adaptation of the Unite for a Better Life program, um, which showed success in rural Ethiopia and then has been adapted to a Somali refugee context. So we're very much going to be focused on the adaptation today. And I'm really pleased to welcome our two speakers today. Um, firstly, we've got uh, Dr. Vandana Sharma, um, Dr. Sharma is a global health researcher at uh, the Harvard um, T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And um, she's got expertise in a range of impact evaluations, randomized control trials and programming in both development and humanitarian contexts. In fact, she has a lot longer biography than that. Um, but that's the, the, the short version of it. And I also have um, Samuel Tewaldi um, with us as well, who's also going to be speaking. Samuel has um, 12 years of experience working in public health and particularly public health responses to sexual and gender-based violence. And this has included the Unite for a Better Life program and, and working on intimate partner violence and HIV prevention, including on this project um, with Somali refugees in, in Ethiopia. So I'm really pleased to welcome both of our speakers today to share their experience um, with us. Just in terms of how the webinar is going to work, so in a moment I'm going to pass over um, to the speakers, but we're going to be having um, about 30 minutes of them talking, and uh, during that time there's going to be a couple of polls for you to interact and just give some views on things, which I think will be really interesting, and then they'll be followed by a Q&A. Um, so I'm just going to, you're going to be able to use the chat for a, a Q&A and I'll, we'll be gathering some questions together, um, which I can then post to the panellists. And then also you'll have an opportunity to ask some follow-up questions on the themes that are, are being discussed. So I'm just going to hand over briefly before we get started to my colleague, um, Juliana Morales, who's just going to explain to you a little bit about the Zoom functionality that we're going to be using today. Over to you, Juliana. Lindsay. Hi, everyone. So yes, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, the webinar is currently being recorded and we will be sharing it via email uh, shortly after this webinar. There also will be time for Q&A at the end, as Lindsay mentioned, and we're hoping that you can engage with us in a couple of ways. Um, please feel free to add any comments or questions directly in the chat box. If you want other people to be able to see your comments, make sure to change the two line uh, here in the, with the red arrow to, to all panelists and attendees, and that means everyone who is attending can see, not just the uh, panelists. Um, you can also raise your hand, like if you have any follow-up questions when we're in the Q&A, you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand and I will go ahead and unmute you um, so you can speak out loud. But those are just a few, few of our housekeeping um, items and I'll turn it back over to Lindsay. Great, thanks, thanks Juliana. So if there's any, any difficulties with that, do put a question um, about anything technical in the chat as well, but hopefully that's quite straightforward. So I'm going to hand over to Vandana and, and Samuel. Thanks very much to both of you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I am going to just turn off my video because I have a slightly unstable internet connection, uh, but I just wanted to have it on for the start just to say hi. Um, so 
Samuel and I are so delighted to be with you today to have the opportunity to share lessons and findings from our work. Um, and as well on behalf of the rest of our team and partners. So as you heard, we'll be speaking about Unite for a Better Life, which is a program to prevent and reduce intimate partner violence, which our team adapted and tested in a humanitarian context. The project was implemented in Dolo Addo, Ethiopia between 2016 and 2018 with several key partners, including Women and Health Alliance International Ethiopia, Addis Ababa University, Harvard Medical School, um, and there was also additional support during implementation from UNHCR and from Ethiopia's Agency for Refugees and Returnees Affairs. We received funding from ELRA's Humanitarian Innovation Fund to support this work. Next slide, please. So the agenda for today's discussion includes the following. A brief introduction about the original Unite for a Better Life program, which was developed for rural communities in Ethiopia, followed by a discussion around the approach and the process uh, for adapting UBL for the humanitarian context, and finally, um, some discussion around the pilot testing of the adapted program and sharing of the lessons learned during adaptation. Next slide, please. So we'll begin with a brief introduction. Next slide. Now, some of you may have participated in the first webinar of this series where we focused on the original version of Unite for a Better Life, which was developed for rural Ethiopian communities. For those of you who are not familiar with UBL, um, this slide summarizes the different research and programming streams that our team has undertaken to generate evidence about UBL in different contexts. So as I mentioned, it was first developed for the rural Ethiopian context where each participatory session uh, within the program is delivered by trained facilitators within the context of the traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony to groups of men, women, or couples. Our team tested the intervention in that context in a large cluster randomized control trial with over seven or close to 7,000 households across 64 villages. The results of the trial demonstrated significant reductions in IPV, in particular sexual intimate partner violence, especially when the intervention was delivered to groups of men. We also saw significant changes across a variety of HIV outcomes, including confidence in using a condom, HIV testing, um, and condom use. Uh, and so we'll share the links for those um, papers that present the primary and secondary findings that were published in PLOS Medicine earlier this year. And we can share those in the chat box and also um, after the webinar. Now, the focus of today's session is this sort of center box, which is the adaptation of UBL for a humanitarian context. Um, and the ad ad adaptation process included formative research to understand the drivers of IPV and HIV risk within this specific context, including how displacement has changed risks um, in order to inform the adapted content. Uh, we included new sessions and also um, changed the modality of delivery slightly by delivering the sessions within the context of Somali tea talks. And then finally, the third box there on the right shows um, uh, another version of the UBL program, which was developed in order to serve harder to reach populations with funding from the World Bank and the Sexual Violence Research Initiative, where um, podcast episodes were developed that correspond with, with each of the in-person sessions. So the next webinar, um, event focused on UBL, the third in the series, scheduled for early 2021, will focus on that podcast uh, version of the program. Next slide, please. Um, so just as a, a really quick refresher about the program, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, UBL is a gender transformative program that aims to prevent IPV and HIV through group-based participatory sessions focusing on building skills. As I mentioned, uh, trained facilitators deliver the sessions and in the original uh, version of UBL, um, the community or cultural practice through which the program is delivered was tra the traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony. And this was done to increase the cultural relevance and potential effectiveness of the program. 
Um, and in the original version, there were 14 sessions delivered across seven weeks. Um, each session's around two to three hours and includes topics such as gender roles, healthy sexuality, uh, HIV and condom use, boundaries and sexual consent, power and control in relationships, joint decision-making, task sharing, communication, conflict resolution, and supporting survivors. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide just shows the theory of change and the logic model for the UBL program. And as you can see, it does align with the ecological model for IPV and addresses underlying individual relationship, community and societal factors that are determinants of risk in this context. Uh, the program aims to improve knowledge, attitudes and skills related to IPV and HIV and improve couples communication, task sharing, joint decision making, HIV risk behavior and substance use. Next slide, please. Now I did mention the facilitation during the coffee ceremonies. Um, in, not only does that improve the uh, cultural relevance and potential effectiveness, but um, the implementation of the curriculum within, within the context of the coffee ceremony offers an opportunity to model and promote more equitable gender norms. Um, in rural Ethiopia, uh, men and women typically participate in the coffee ceremony but it's usually women who prepare and pour the coffee. Uh, so within the program, in the men's groups and in the couples groups, uh, male facilitators model the preparation of the coffee in the first two sessions of the program. Following this, uh, male, participa male participants then take turns for the remainder of sessions to prepare the coffee. Um, next slide, please. And so to set the stage a little bit for our discussion of the adaptation process, I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about the humanitarian context in which we worked. So Boklo Mayo is one of five Somali refugee camps near Dalo Ado, Ethiopia, a small town bordering Somalia. Decades of conflict, unstable governance and periods of drought in Somalia have led to widespread population displacement. At the time of the study, UNHCR estimated that over 200,000 Somali refugees were registered within those five camps uh, near Dalo Ado, with about 40,000 residing in Bo Boklomayo. And Boklomayo was the first camp to be established in the area, and it opened in 2009. The area is quite uh, poor and geographically isolated, with the nearest uh, tarmac road being about 300 kilometers away. Next slide, please. So now uh, before we delve into the adaptation process and before I hand over to Samuel, we're going to launch our first uh, poll right now. And so we wanted to just get a sense from the group um, whether uh, you have ever been involved in an adaptation of an evidence-based intimate partner violence prevention program. So you should have a poll that's popped up on your screen. Um, if you wouldn't mind sort of clicking your response and hitting submit. I'll give you a few seconds to do that and then we can take a look at the responses. And so Juliana, whenever you think you have uh, received enough responses. Great, so that's really helpful to know that um, there's actually a, almost 40% of you have been involved in some sort of adaptation. Um, so that's great. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that in our discussion. So now I'll just pass it over to Samuel who will tell us a little bit more about the process for adapting UBL. Okay, thank you very much Vandana and uh, hi everyone. So this slide uh, shows the project timeline that was uh, implemented uh, between 2016 and 2018. And right after laying the foundation work, uh, um, our team conducted the formative research, went through the theory of change logic model requirements, and then uh, developed the, and adapted the UBL sessions for the Somali context and then piloted the program. Um, once uh, um, our 16 sessions for men, women and couples uh, group were adapted and developed, 
it was uh, translated to the local language, back translated and pretested with a group of 10 couples. And their inputs uh, uh, included content uh, refined and then the session, session content uh, being uh, externally reviewed. And then the final pilot version of the program was um, tested in the pilot study, which will be discussed later. And our facilitators were recruited from the camp uh, and obviously highly being trained. And they delivered the session to a randomly selected groups of men, women, and couples. And data were collected before the program started and uh, after the program was completed. Next slide, please. So the formative research uh, that we in um, uh, conducted included around 30 in-depth interviews, 10 focus group discussions, and 10 participatory learning activities, which included uh, vignettes and pre-listing exercises. We um, also conducted three community mapping exercises. And the intervention were conducted in local language by trained enumerators. Uh, the data obtained was uh, transcribed, translated to English, and then an analyzed. Uh, we'll share uh, the link of those two papers that have already been published uh, from this data, uh, uh, I mean, in, in, in the uh, text box, and then, of course, uh, right after the uh, conclusion of this presentation. Next slide, please. So the team has uh, obtained uh, findings where uh, numerous forms of GBV perpetrated against women and girls, uh, including sexual violence, physical and verbal violence that occur in the camp and uh, the host community, and non-partner sexual violence, including rape at firewood collection sites and at uh, food and water distribution points was also described. And IPV in the home was the most common forms of uh, GBV described by the participants. Uh, approximately around 80% of women reported experiencing physical IPV and some 69% uh, uh, reported experiencing sexual IPV, IPV in uh, their lifetime. Uh, another findings relating to displacement related change uh, reported to increase uh, GBV risks. For example, uh, lack of employment opportunities, uh, increased poverty and loss of livelihoods and of uh, loss of uh, Somali, Somali cultural practices were um, noted to impact mental health, leading to increased uh, substance uh, use uh, chat among men and IPV uh, perpetration. Uh, respondents also noted that there is um, increased access to education uh, for women and girls in the camp as compared to uh, pre-displacement, which um, contributes to better economic opportunities for women and girls, but also to uh, shifting traditional gender roles, potentially uh, increasing tensions within the household and exacerbating IPV. Uh, our research highlighted the complex interaction between numerous factors uh, underlying GBV and IPV risk among the Somali refugees in this setting, and displacement-related changes to social and uh, cultural norms, poverty, access to resources, physical spaces, along with persistent gender inequalities, uh, worsen the risk of violence against women and girls. Next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, several codes uh, uh, were obtained from the qualitative data uh, that highlight the prevalent uh, norms and attitudes related to the position of women and their role in the society. Uh, for example, one read, she should endure violence for the sake of Allah. And this, as you can see, puts uh, religion to justify violence. And another one reads, inside the family, there is a greater violence she look after the children, she prepares place for him to sleep, cooks the food and fetches the water, but still he treats her brutally. Another one reads, whenever he needs sexual intercourse, she must be ready if it's day or night. 
and even you can imagine if a woman should say no in this kind of uh, relationship. And then another one reads because she is equivalent to half of men, and this is another uh, you know religious uh, citation uh, to justify ill treatment. So this uh, sorts of quotes alone uh, shows the prevalent norms and attitudes related to the position of women and girls uh, their, in their society and calls the need for a powerful program to challenge it. So one thing uh, what we did uh, was seeing that religion was interwoven with cultural norms. We developed a protocol for our young men and women facilitators that would uh, enable them challenge resistant participants that may bring religion to justify violence. Uh, considering, I mean, that Islam being a religion of peace, we keep our facilitators to be confident enough and say no to these sorts of norms and attitudes. And the citations that, you know, some of the participants may mention have no place in the Holy Quran or other supplemental books and are simply out of context ideas that are put to justify violence or other ill treatment. So we try to equip our facilitators both in the training and then of course in their having a, a protocol or guidelines. Next slide, please. Uh, our research um, also identified an important link between displacement, chat use and IPV. And for those of you who may not know what CHAT is, uh, it is a plant with uh, stimulant properties that is legally and easily available and chewed in the Horn of Africa, including in Ethiopia, Somalia, Djibouti, etc. So displacement related factors, uh, including loss of livelihoods, increased poverty, stress and trauma have contributed to uh, increased consumption of CHAT among men uh, in this setting. Chat use was uh, described as uh, being linked to IPV through three uh, mechanisms. And the first one is directly it was reported to lead uh, to increased anger and aggression, which can uh, eventually lead to physical IPV. Uh, chat was, uh, use was also reported to contribute to increased sexual desire and sexual IPV. And finally, through a more indirect route uh, where chat was described as having economic impacts on families and tensions and conflicts arise when a man uses all their household resources to purchase uh, and chew chat and this can uh, escalate to violence. Next slide please. So uh, speaking about the adaptation process, uh, the formative research that uh, we collected at the start of the program were used to inform the adaptation of the program, which involved uh, several steps. First, the workshop was uh, partners was contact, conducted to develop and adapt the theory of change, the logic model of the program. Um, existing content was uh, adapted for the Somali culture and refugees context. This involved ensuring that uh, the various role plays, the stories and uh, different activities uh, we had the original UBN was uh, uh, to be culturally appropriate and relevant. And the platform for delivery of the, the intervention was also selected based on the input from the formative research. And as a result, Somali tea talks were chosen given that this is a popular way that people gather uh, and discuss various topics in this context. And additional content that did not exist in the original UBL was developed to address displacement related factors uh, contributing to IPV risk. This included the addition of two new sessions. The first one is uh, harm reduction related chat use and sexual harassment. Uh, finally, as uh, indicated earlier, sessions were uh, translated to the local language, pre-tested with 10 uh, couples in the camp and then externally being uh, reviewed. Then based on the feedback from the pre-testing and the external review, they were further refined and finalized. And one of the key challenge uh, in this process was balancing the adaptation with fidelity. In fidelity, I mean the degree to which the adapted program maintains the essential ingredients of the original intervention. Next slide, please. 
So fidelity was uh, prioritized and maintained in the following areas, uh, in the facilitation model and training approach, the core curricular uh, content on the skills and various activities, and on the emphasis and approach to community engagement at all levels of the program, and the delivery of the session via community or cultural practice. Uh, here you can see on the right side, uh, you know, the final list of the 16 adopted UBL sessions. And with that, I think, uh, thank you uh, so much for your attention. Now I'll pass it over to Vandana, who will be speaking a bit more about the piloting of the adopted UBL program and lessons learned around it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Samuel. Um, so before I speak a bit more about the pilot testing, we're going to <laughs> launch our second poll question for the group, um, just to get your uh, thoughts and experiences around um, adaptation and just wondering what you feel is sort of the biggest challenge with adapting IPV prevention programs for different contexts. And so you've got a few different choices there. I know it might be a hard choice, but if you could just select what you think is the biggest challenge, um, and then hit submit, that would be great. Great, thanks uh, Juliana. So it looks like we have um, uh, a range of um, equally sort of spread out opinions around sort of lack of limited available of availability of guidance, lack of time, um, lack of or limitations in partner implementing capacity, et cetera. So that's really interesting to have that feedback. Great, thanks. So let's um, move on. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. So I'll just really briefly tell you about our pilot testing of the adapted versions of the curricula. So um, as Samuel mentioned, we went through quite the process for adapting the three versions of the curricula, a men's version, women's version, and couples version. After they were finalized, we did a small pilot study with about 200 households in the camp. And we used a design that parallels the RCT that we carried out in rural Ethiopia, where we had, you know, some households participated, sampled to participate in just the men's only groups, some for the women's only groups, and some for the couples groups. What we found was um, uh, fairly high participation rates in the women's and uh, couples groups, slightly lower in the men's groups. Um, our key indicators did demonstrate acceptability, relevance, and utility of the program. We also tracked unintended consequences and potential risks to participants, and uh, none of the participants reported um, increased spousal conflict or violence as a result of participation in the program. About 95% of women reported sharing information that they learned during the UBL sessions with others, on average, they shared with about seven other people, including spouses, friends, neighbors, and relatives. And around 92% reported satisfaction uh, with UBL. Next slide, please. Just to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the changes or trends in changes and attitudes and norms, you can see a few on this slide here. Um, we did see um, some uh, observed shifts. So for example, around 70% of women at baseline agreed with the statement that it is, un it is acceptable for a man to beat his wife um, if she is unfaithful. At end line, you know, that had dropped down to about 40%. Um, and you can see sort of uh, similar trends on some of these um, uh, attitudes. So these findings do, um, kind of suggests that the adapted version of the program is promising and could potentially influence norms, attitudes, and um, some of the behaviors that we're interested in. However, it should be noted that this, you know, was a small pilot study, you know, the sample size was small, follow-up period was really short. So we are looking to do, uh, you know, more rigorous evaluation to assess longer-term outcomes. Uh, we did have the chance to visit um, some of the participants about a year after participating participation in the program. 
uh, to hear a little bit more about some of the changes that happened. Um, and, you know, we can share some of those uh, stories with you. Um, I won't go into that in a lot of detail now, but there was some really um, uh, heartwarming stories about sort of relationship changes and impacts on families. Next slide, please. And so um, we wanted to spend the last bit of our presentation to share some of the lessons around adaptation that um, came out of this work. Um, and so I think the main one cutting across all aspects of the program is the need to prioritize community-based participation in the development, adaptation, and implementation processes. Uh, there were other lessons related to research, uh, program content, and program delivery that are shown here on this slide. So for research, um, uh, we sort of want to highlight the importance of formative research as being critical to understanding the determinants of violence in a given setting and ensuring that the program content is grounded in evidence and tailored to address uh, key determinants for that particular context. We do recognize that it might not always be possible to do formal research, um, in which case I think it's still important to gather as much information as possible through existing data, uh, conversations with local NGOs, community leaders, stakeholders, and key informants, and of course as well through a thorough literature review. In terms of the program content, um, some of the factors that uh, should be considered uh, when looking at the program content include uh, taking into account the literacy level, uh, religion, culture, and language, uh, while um, ensuring program fidelity. Displaced populations are often living in insecure and deeply challenging situations, and program content should reflect that. Additional content may need to address displacement-related factors that influence relationship dynamics in IPV, such as changes in family composition and marital practices, trauma and mental health, substance use and coping behaviors. And then in terms of program delivery, uh, for UBL in particular, it's imperative, and, and I think this is true for most uh, similar types of programs, it is imperative that uh, this type of program be delivered by trained facilitators from the community, but there are some aspects of the program delivery that you know, may need to be adapted for a particular context. So that includes things like the timing, frequency, and location of sessions, um, uh, risk mitigation and ethical considerations. And then for UBL in particular, because it's delivered through a community or cultural practice, obviously that's going to uh, need to change depending on the specific context. And then next slide, please. And so um, we also pulled together um, some considerations related to humanitarian context specifically and how those may influence IPB programs. And so the following factors um, sort of came up when uh, we were working on this project um, as being sort of uh, factors related to humanitarian context. So the type and phase of emergency um, is an important consideration and may affect uh, the feasibility of implementation, participation rates, and stakeholder engagement. Um, this may also influence existing programs, resources, and services available to GBV survivors. For example, in a really acute phase of an emergency, there may not be established referral pathways. And um, if that's not the case, um, that those don't exist, then it may not be um, possible to implement you know, an IPV prevention program. Um, some other factors to consider are sort of um, indicators or measures around gender equality in a particular setting and how those may be influenced by displacement, uh, disruption of social cohesion, including family and relationship dynamics resulting from displacement, uh, as well as changes in family composition and structure. Um, Samuel touched a bit on um, some of the uh, underlying factors uh, related to IPV and relationship dynamics that were affected in our context and how those contributed to IPV risk. And so those are things to consider. Um, and then displacement may also affect existing community and cultural practices that came out really strongly in our qualitative work. Um, and in fact, some of the loss of cultural practices 
um, and community events and things like that also contributed to um, sort of some of the mental health outcomes. Next slide, please. And then just to really quickly mention, we do have a number of UBL resources. Uh, so there are three curricula available in Somali, Amharic, and English for men, women, and couples. There's also a program implementation and facilitator training toolkit, as well as a visual media toolkit, which was designed to help build empathy and challenge gender norms through a visual media approach. And that's available for program implementers and master trainers working in uh, GBV and or in humanitarian settings. And um, in terms of sort of the future, we are hoping, as I mentioned, to sort of do a more rigorous evaluation of this adapted version of UBL to assess uh, impact on longer term outcomes. We're also interested in uh, comparing other modalities of delivery of the program, including the podcast version, which we will be talking about in the part three of the webinar series. And then we're also thinking about scaling up um, in other sites. Next slide, please. And lastly, we just wanted to mention an exciting new project that um, our team has just launched together with the Sexual Violence Research Initiative that is focused on uh, developing guidance and tools for adapting IPV prevention programs. So we'll be compiling lessons uh, from UBL as well as Maisha, uh, another um, intervention in RCT that was done in Tanzania. Um, and we'll also um, look to other IPV prevention program adaptations with the aim of developing a guidance note, a series of case studies, as well as some other outputs um, that will be relevant uh, for practitioners and researchers and other stakeholders. Um, the case studies may focus on topics such as adapting from non-humanitarian to humanitarian settings, from in-person to tech-based platforms, um, as well as potentially uh, COVID-19 related adaptations for IPV prevention. So we are asking for your help as well. So if you do have any relevant documents, examples, or lessons related to adaptations, please do feel free to share those with us. Um, and there are you know, several other ways to be involved as well. Um, for example, uh, participating in a key informant interview or providing input around uh, some of the outputs like the guidance note or case studies. So feel free to email me. My email is uh, there on the screen and we can share that with you after as well if you are interested in contributing uh, to this. Next slide, please. So I will end there um, and just wanna thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to share and we look forward uh, to discussing further in the Q&A. Great, thanks very much to both of you for a really, um, really interesting and really um, comprehensive presentation taking us through the, everything from the formative research and the sort of adaptation to the, the different results and, and the lessons learned as well. That was great and you were exactly 30 minutes. So thank you very much for that as well. So I just want to encourage um, posting questions. There are a few questions that have come up in the chat, um, which I'm gonna to gather together now. Um, but if you do have more questions, please put those in the chat box. And if you can, please remember to address them, change the little label to um, panelists and attendees so others can see your questions um, as well. So let me have a look at some of the questions we've got. Um, I would encourage questions both, um, obviously about any aspect of the presentation. So they could be about the programme and the programme adaptation. Um, they could be about the research and the research design, um, et cetera. So you can ask um, any of those. I know that Samuel's got to leave us in about 20 minutes, half an hour. So I might address some of the questions um, around the programme first. Um, there's been a couple of questions in the chat clarifying um, where to find documents um, that have been mentioned by Vandana and Samuel. So there are some, quite, some answers to that coming in the chat now. So there's clarification questions, they'll be answered uh, in, in the chat. And if you will start off with some questions to Vandana and Samuel, but then also uh, there were quite a few of you on the call who do have experience of adaptation. So it would also be really great if you want to share one of your experiences to put that in the chat or you can put your hand up as well um, and I can come to you because I think it'd be really nice to hear some other experiences of adaptation as well. So let me just go to um, 
a couple of the questions that have already come up um, that have been gathered together. So we've got a question, um, I think perhaps this could um, go to Samuel, first of all, but Samuel, you talked when you were talking about um, the adaptation and you were talking about training facilitators, for example, to respond to questions that might be around um, the Quran and what Islam teaches. So I've got a question um, from Maritu here, who's asking, you know, is this different from other settings where Islam is predominant? Is this, to what extent is this more to do with broader negative cultural social norms rather than with Islam per se? So I think Samuel, that's probably one that you, you could answer and Vandana, you can come in if you wish to as well. So could I ask you that first, Samuel, please? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, the, we, we, I mean, this is, uh, of course, uh, predominantly uh, Muslim community, uh, Somali community. And then I could say around maybe more than 99.9% target or 100% of the target are uh, Muslim community. And uh, such kind of view uh, has nothing to do with the teaching of Islam because uh, you know, we know that uh, Islam is, you know, uh, a religion of peace, but it's all about uh, the negative teaching or cultural, negative cultural uh, norms that are, uh, um, you know, being practiced within the community. And then, of course, as uh, indicated in some of the uh, formative research, for example, I can say, share where Vandana mentioned around 70% of um, women when they were presented with a statement about how you know wife beating by husband whether he or justified and they said yes he's justified because the holy quran or our, our religion says so uh, and then what we did was try to dig you know such kind of verses that does it really exist in the holy quran and the answer was totally no so it's not about you know the preaching of islam but it's the negative uh, you know um, how we call it, the negative uh, teachings or the negative norms that uh, exist within the, within the society. So we have to bring, you know, uh, our uh, facilitators at par in a position to say that, for example, if they hear such kind of statement from any participant, to ask that participant, where did you hear that? Which part of the Holy Quran or the, you know, other supplementary uh, text say about this? But Coming to the point, it's totally non-existent. People try to create stories just to justify whatever they are doing. And you would not find any uh, anywhere in the Holy Quran that say that wife beating is justified. Just simply bring the, you know, uh, how you call it, or take a partially uh, existent, uh, you know, issue in the Holy Quran and translate it negatively, negatively to suit their own, um, uh, you know, texts or con contexts. And maybe I can add a few words too around um, sort of some of the religious um, uh, topics that Samuel was talking about. And I will say in our um, original uh, implementation of UBL in the rural communities in Ethiopia, we had a fairly high Muslim population there too. I would say about 60% of the households um, identified as or reported being Muslim, but we didn't um, see the same sort of... Um, justifications being expressed um, around, uh, you know, using religion to justify violence in the same way. Um, so, you know, when we were adapting uh, for the Somali refugee camps and, you know, this emerged during our formative research as being a really important um, uh, way that uh, violence is being justified, you know, we, felt like we had to take a really sensitive approach to it um, and made sure we have a community advisory board um, in the camp. We had one in the rural Ethiopian context as well. In the camp, the community advisory board includes um, clan leaders, religious leaders. It includes uh, women who are um, part of women's groups, uh, community members, and so on. And so, you know, there's quite a lot of dialogue with that group too around really how to sensitively 
um, address, uh, you know, some of the attitudes around religion that were um, quite prevalent in this context. Um, and, and so I just wanted to mention that because it's not an easy uh, topic to uh, address in a, a thoughtful, sensitive way. And we wanted to be really careful with how that sort of was being presented and kind of the discussions around that. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, I've got a question now, which I might address um, firstly at Vandana, but Samuel, you may want to add as well. It's actually a little bit more about the, the formative research, um, the participatory methods, the specific methods that you use. I mean, you mentioned vignettes. So that's a question from Devika. And if I may just add a little bit to that, to, to, to liberty as a moderator, just in terms of, you know, to what extent did the use of vignettes and these kind of participatory tools sort of help you to I guess identify prevalent norms but also identify a little bit of nuance in those norms because previous work that uh, myself and some other colleagues have been involved in we've used those kind of vignettes to help us to see well where is it that norms are already sort of bending and shifting and under what circumstances so maybe you could say a bit about the participatory tools they use but also if you could answer that question about what did that tell you about about norms and where there may already be positive deviance if you like to to build off in in the curriculum Sure, uh, maybe I can start and Samuel, if you have anything to add, um, you can feel free to jump in afterwards. Um, so in terms of the participatory methods, we included um, free listing where, um, you know, these are group based uh, sessions where the participants would kind of list off all the different forms of violence they uh, feel are occurring in the camp and then sort of with the facilitator, um, go through those different forms and kind of group them into the locations where they're happening, uh, rank them in order uh, around sort of which are the most common forms and so on. And then the second type was the vignettes where there were actual stories um, around uh, like examples of a couple experiencing violence, for example, or, um, you know, there were several of those and then the group would go through those and there were questions at each point of the story to sort of ask what would what would you tell this woman to do or you know, what would what would a woman in this situation actually do in that circumstance and so these were alternative ways to gather some insights around um, attitudes behaviors you know all of that and um, some of that data is still being analyzed it, it's you know quite far in the anal analysis process, but we don't have it published just yet. Um, but one of the sort of insights was that we have sort of different, different information coming out of the research with the different modalities. So different information came out of the in-depth interviews versus the focus group discussions versus the participatory methods. And um, I think that's important when we're thinking about um, the type of formative research we do to inform programming. Um, in particular, I have to say IPV did not really come out much in the individual in-depth interviews, but in, um, or actually, I'm sorry, it came out more in the individual in-depth interviews than it did in some of the other approaches. Um, and so, you know, there's more to say about that, but I'll just pause there. But I think the key takeaway is just that there are, you know, different, different information comes out of different approaches. And so I think we have to select our method uh, carefully uh, when we're planning our formative research. And I don't know, Samuel, if you had anything you wanted to add, I know you were very actively involved in, in these um, participatory uh, uh, methods. Not really. Thank you so much, Madana. You already <laughs> mentioned, yeah, everything. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I've got another question here from um, Susan, which I'll direct first at Samuel, which Samuel is about um, male participation in, in the programming. So you did mention a little bit during the presentation about participation rates. Um, but I think those of us that work in the field know that it's often quite challenging um, to secure male participation. So Susan is asking both, you know, did you see differences in male participation between the rural, the first rural Ethiopia implementation and then the second one in the Somali refugee camp? Um, and secondly, you know, did you make specific changes to encourage um, male participation and, and what, were, what were those? Um, I 
in fact, uh, we did not see much uh, differences uh, in terms of male participation, uh, except in the uh, second dollar UBL, uh, you know, uh, because of the living condition, because of the displacement effects, uh, it was quite, uh, you know, hard to uh, maintain the level of uh, participation at highest level without the original, uh, you know, the original uh, planned uh, or the way we planned it. But uh, since, uh, as Vandana mentioned, we try to engage uh, the various community, uh, you know, structures within the camp and established our own uh, community advisory boards and then try to get some inputs or insights from them. Uh, we were able to bring, uh, you know, some of the, the, you know, the male participants back to the discussion. And of course, um, uh, you know, uh, prior to uh, uh, deciding when and where, at what pace to engage, we try to consult as much as possible with the, uh, you know, the community advisory team and the refugee, you know, uh, agency structure, and including the UNHCR and ARA personnel, and then try to find, you know, a possible the only challenge we have was to find the right time to engage men without any interruption or uh, uh, loss and we try to uh, you know um, uh, consult with those uh, institutions and with the participants as well and then choose the right time to engage them yeah and and I Vandana, do you want to add something yeah, I was just going to add, like, I think the piece that Samuel mentioned about, you know, coordination with the existing structures in the camp was extremely important. Um, for example, uh, when there was food distribution planned, um, you know, nobody's available to come and participate in in-group sessions because everybody's going to collect their, um, their food rations. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we had really close relationships with um, UNHCR and ARA and can kind of coordinate our program around other things going on um, in the camp was, I think, really important to, to uh, ensure continual engagement in, in the program. Thank you. Can I just ask a clarification, clarification question? Did you provide um, incentives for participation, whether that's you know, monetary incentives or other incentives, because this is often a question that comes up a lot um, in terms of, you know, trying to encourage participation, but also recognize that people are giving their time. Did you have incentives in this case? Yes, we did. And Samuel, do you want to talk, talk, tell a little more about the um, incentives and kind of the decisions around it? Because there were you know, different types of incentives provided in the two settings in rural Ethiopia versus in the camp. Uh, yes, uh, I mean the you know the model that we follow both in the original UBL and in the second one Dolo Ado is that you know we don't want to bring uh, you know part participants or any program personnel for the sake of you know getting incentives. So in the original UBL we follow the model that instead of cash incentive would provide in kind incentive in the form of you know providing soap. You know the daily basics like wheat, spaghetti, etc. So that's what we we followed in the original UBA in Butajira. With uh, and then of course in 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 the in the local context, I mean in our context in Somalia, uh, considering in kind incentive was quite uh, unthinkable because of the, you know the dire geographical location. That you know you cannot find the basic ingredients is they have to travel, you know, quite either it has to fly into, you know, the refugee center from Addis or they have to go some 300 kilometers to the nearby big town to, you know, to find. So logistically, this was unthinkable. So uh, following the, you know, the model in Butajira or on the original UBL, we uh, planned to provide some sort of incentive. When I say some sort, uh, some sort uh, is like, you know, one do dollar and 50 uh, uh, cents would be provided for any participant, provided that he or she attended, attended, let's say, you know, four sessions in a row. So we don't, we, ju we just want to motivate participants to come from one session to the other, to, to the other or conclude the entire session un um, uninterrupted. Uh, but we do not uh, provide the incentive, uh, you know, um, for each and every, but rather try to group it. 
And this way, uh, we, we want to make sure that participants will be exposed to, to the entire dose of the, the program. And then of course, achieve our, uh, you know, reduce the attrition level. And uh, like I said, in, in, in Dolo, we did provide like uh, $1 and 20, 25 cents um, per attending, I mean, when a participant attended four sessions. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for answering that, Samuel. That's really helpful. Um, I've got a question from Pan, who's asking about, you know, when you talked about adapting, um, she's talking about tools. I think, I think Pan, you're meaning the curriculum. Um, when you're talking about adapting those and getting feedback from the community, I think through the piloting you did and getting feedback, did you encounter challenges in that sort of whole process of trying to adapt and, and get feedback on that, in that adaptation process? I don't know who's best placed to answer that. So I'll let one of you jump in. I mean, you know, one, one challenge we, uh, uh, as, um, um, you know, I mean, one challenge was mentioned about, about you know, maintaining the fidelity issue. Uh, but again, when adapting and then trying to bring it to the community, one significant challenge or the time consumed, you know, consuming, consuming challenge was to find, I mean, to translate it into Somali language, uh, because, you know, on the original UBL, it was quite easy uh, to translate it from Amharic, I mean, from English to the local language Amharic. Uh, but um, in, the, in our context from English, to Somali, that was quite, quite challenging. Uh, first, you have to find, you know, uh, the right candidates. And then second, that individual should speak also the local language because in Somali, it's not only Somali, there are the local dialects. And then of course, you have to be able to find that. And then of course, that was quite, quite uh, time consuming. You want to add something, Bandana? Um... I mean, I think you touched on on a lot of it even earlier during the presentation, but I mean, other just sort of logistics things, you know, finding appropriate spaces within uh, the camp to sort of hold the <laughs> sessions, I think was a little more challenging than um, in the other context where we originally implemented the program. Um, I think, you know, in the, in the camps, there's no electricity, uh, there's no, uh, you know, no phone network, you know, communication with our team was really challenging, you know, all sorts of issues like that um, came up. Uh, but I think with respect to adaptation and sort of the feedback from the community, um, I think the community was quite engaged, you know, at all levels of this and were, were really um, interested to participate and provide that feedback. And I think the community advisory board was really active and really involved as were, you um, uh, our colleagues at UNHCR and ARA. So I think it was really nice to have all of that input. And I think that really strengthened uh, the process. Great, thanks to both of you. So I've got a slightly related question or a couple of questions from Ruti, who's asking, I mean, it's really questions around this adaptation and it's a question of fidelity. Um, because all of us sort of deal with this, it's like we want to sort of work out whether the program works in a different setting. So we have to do a certain amount of adaptation, but then we have to say, well, you know, how much fidelity do we need and what are the elements of those fidelity? And you, about, about that fidelity, you talked a bit about it, but maybe you can say a bit more about how you made those decisions about which key areas to maintain fidelity on and then sort of, you know, relate to that, what, what therefore changed in terms of content. You talked about two extra sessions, but was there something that changed about delivery methods? I mean, you talked about the tea ceremony and the two extra sessions. Could you just say a bit more about that decision-making process or both about what changed, but also how to make that difficult decision about what fidelity actually means and how much to change? Um, is that a, I don't know, is that a question for you? Bandana, yeah. and, and then Samuel. Samuel first. I don't yeah, know. sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is like, uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, right at the very beginning of the program uh, development, and of course, uh, while we're sitting for, I mean, with the part with partners, uh, you know, to develop the lo theory of change lo logic model. The first thing we did was, you know, we have to decide whether, you know, how to be. Uh, trustworthy when it comes to the adaptation because uh, um, uh, you know uh, we we don't we, we can't copy paste it as it is the original UBL to the Somali question in one way or the other it has to be 
we said we are going to adapt it. And then of course we have to be uh, uh, honest uh, and then of course decide which elements, uh, um, you know, should be, we should be, uh, how you call it, trustworthy in keeping it as it is without significant change and we should be changing. And of course that would be derived by uh, input that we obtain from the formative research. So our general understanding was that, uh, you know, uh, and, and that, you know, on the facilitation model, in the facilitation model, I mean, uh, training highly our facilitators is something that we have to stick because these are our backbone that would lead us to a certain change. And then of course we stick to the facilitation model and the training approach also. Lengthy, lengthy training, uh, you know, let's say two weeks of training to the facilitators and followed by ex an extensive uh, preparation, a real critical challenging to make sure that they are well equipped before going in and selling the ideas to the larger community. This is something that we stick. And then of course the core components of the, you know, the, the content is something that we, we say we have to uh, maintain fidelity in the core components because uh, we want to ensure that, you know, uh, intimate partner violence is reduced or, uh, you know, prevented. So core components are something that we uh, uh, discussed. And then of course, the, value, the, the various skills and activities and uh, uh, also is something that we uh, discuss and then try to maintain as it is, but still that would be, you know, subject to uh, input that we get from the qualitative data. And then of course, once we conducted the uh, formative research and with the entire team members and the partner organizations sit together, we, uh, you know, certain change occurred, such as, uh, you know, changing the, um, uh, the coffee ceremony, which doesn't exist within the Somali community to the Tito, which is highly popular. Uh, yeah. I guess just, Vanda, I'm going to go to you as well, yeah. but I guess just to, just to go a bit further on that from what Ruti was asking, I guess it's also, you know, from the formative research and from this testing you did, did you actually, you know, so you might have a session that's like couples communication skills. I think that was on the list of the curriculum sessions, but maybe the actual scenarios that you use for interactive exercises are different. So maybe the theme is the same, but maybe you use a different interactive exercise or a different example because of what you found out. So did you change at that level as well? Or did you largely use similar kind of exercises and similar content within the sessions that you kept? I don't know, Samuel, if you want to continue with that, or Vanden, then you want to come in. Ah, uh, yeah. Is it for me, Samuel? Yeah, 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 Sa yeah, yeah. Well, you can, yeah, you can continue to watch Samuel. It's just really sort of, get, I guess, it gets getting down to some of that sort of nitty gritty about, you know, did you need to adapt exercises, adapt the examples in exercises as well um, for this, this different context? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, this yeah. is unquestionable because I mean, the exercises or the various activities would be there, but when we are adapting, we have to make sure that are relevant to the Somali community. Uh, you know, the, specifically to our couple groups also, there are, there might be some activities, you know, they said that the, uh, the requirement for, for us to have the pre-testing is to, to learn from, from the participants, whether, we, you know, things that we got from the formative research, and then once we developed or adapt the intervention, would it go along the way we did it in the original UBL or, you know, name changing, for example, activities, you know, I mean, stories, it has to be completely adapted to the Somali, but without losing the essential, uh, you know, ingredients of that program. So there were some nitty gritty here and there change uh, during the adaptation. Make sure that it's relevant to our context. Okay. Vandana, do you want to jump in? I mean, I think Samuel, you covered it really nicely. Um, I will just say, yeah, I think the the one thing that did not change is the facilitation model and training, and that. Um, was a conscious decision. I think, as Samuel said, you know, the ensuring that the facilitators are um, really well trained and able to deliver the program appropriately um, and lead the discussions and you know facilitate was obviously a, a major priority. And our model for delivering um, the for facilitating the sessions and for the training is that the participants go through the program first as, or sorry, the facilitators go through the program first as participants. And then that allows them the opportunity to sort of address and challenge their own 
uh, norms and attitudes that might be uh, inequitable. Um, and then after that, participate in the intensive facilitation training. Um, and then sort of the, you know, same sex facilitation. So, uh, you know, male facilitators facilitating men's only groups, women facilitators facilitating women's only groups and one male and one female facilitator facilitating the couples groups. So that was maintained throughout. Um, and then as Samuel said, there were, you know, very specific cultural adaptations, language adaptations, you know, making exercises, activities, uh, relevant not only to uh, you know sort of the like the culture but also what we found in the formative research and so you know as as you rightly pointed out there's two new sessions that weren't in the original um, program and that was really meant to get at uh, chat use which was a much bigger problem in this setting um, and and as well uh, sexual harassment, which is one that um, emerged as well during the formative research. Great, thank you. So I've got a, um, a contribution actually here from, I've got a question from Laurie to ask you in a minute, but Laurie, there's also a, something to share. And actually I'd encourage, I mean, I'm gonna ask, actually ask Laurie, ask, so, uh, Judanna for you to unmute Laurie so she can share this experience. And I just wanted to encourage others as well that are, here um, in the participant group to, to maybe share an experience or put your hand up, Juliana will, will find you. And you, if you wanna share an experience as well. So Laurie, let, maybe you just wanna share the experience you put in the, in the chat. Juliana, can you unmute Laurie? She seems to be still muted. Yeah. Here, yeah, I there you can go. hear me now. Yeah. Um, I was just going back to very early on in the conversation when um, one of the, the participants was talking about the Quran and people's sort of justification of violence and and male authority and things linked to religion. And, and I think this is a really important um, piece of the puzzle in some settings more than others that we tend, I think, to shy away from um, because it is so sensitive. And yet at the same time, I think um, what we see is that in many settings, religion is such an important touchstone um, and, and that you know, left unattended or addressed or discussed, these kinds of beliefs can really you know, create an environment where it, it becomes very hard for others to change their ideas or beliefs because you know, someone throws down the, the, the card of, well, the Bible says this, or the Quran says this. And, and I just wanted to share an example in Uganda, we were working with a program uh, that was having recruiting pastors, Christian now, um, uh, to work with couples um, around marital counseling, premarital counseling and the like. And, and there you saw the same thing. It wasn't the Quran, but people were often um, citing the Bible as the, the reason, the justification. Um, and so, you know, what we did is both created space with pastors to look at the text, you know, really challenge some of the beliefs because sometimes things are not in there that people say are in the text. Other times they're specific interpretations that can, uh, where others have interpreted differently. And other times there's ways to, for example, cite other texts that promote a more positive vision. And so I just, you know, I, I just wanted to, to encourage us um, to think about the role of religion in people's lives and what that means and what that means for uh, norm change and, and, and things in these settings. And so, and also just to make the larger thing that it's not just Islam, right? Everyone knows that it's, it's people use their moral touchstones and they get to, to justify a lot of things in all religions, so. Thanks, Laurie. Um, I'm just there's a, there's a few questions waiting about research. I just want to say Samuel had to leave. Um, he says thank you to everybody for the interesting questions. 
So there are a few questions on the research side for Vandana, but just before we go to those, I wanted to see if anybody else in the in the audience wanted to share an experience like Laurie did about the programme in Uganda or, or ask a question out loud. If you do, you can put your hand up and Juliana, maybe you can call out people if there is anybody. I'll just give it a couple of seconds to see if anyone wants to share. Are you seeing anything? <laughs> Juliana, is that a no? It's a quiet bunch today. <laughs> okay, well, look, I'll, I'll go ahead. There's a couple of questions about um, sort of on the research side as well, Vandana, I'll ask of you. And please don't be shy if you've got an experience to share. That would be really, really valuable. So Vandana, I had a question from Laurie, and then I've got a couple of questions as well. Um, Laurie's asking, well, it's actually both a, a kind of program and research question, really, depending on how you do this. But how actually did you track for unintended consequences, sort of be they um, negative or positive? And did you do that through sort of specific research or did you do that sort of on an ongoing basis through, I guess, through the program team? So how did you track unintended consequences? Great. Thanks for that question. Uh, we had a couple different ways in which that was done. One was through um, sort of regular monitoring um, you know, during the program implementation. Um, so, you know, facilitators would, um, sort of be aware of this issue. And if, if something came out in discussions they had, or if somebody disclosed, um, an issue to them, then, uh, you know, that was one way we would be able to identify and track that. We also had post session, uh, short questionnaires, um, where, uh, I think it was two, people in each group would be randomly selected to participate in a, in a short survey questionnaire following the session. And in there, there was sort of a question around sort of uh, any negative consequences or you know, things like that. And so that was another way we tracked it. And then in our endline survey, which was done uh, around one to two months post-program, we also had a series of questions around uh, consequences there. So we asked about, you know, whether participation in the program affected, uh, you know, relationship with uh, spouse, uh, relationship with other family members, uh, relationship within the broader community. Um, you know, there was, I can't remember the exact, uh, items, but there was also some questions around, you know, stigma related to participating in the program, etc. cetera. Uh, lost wages, you know, we tried to capture a range of different things to see um, how participation in the program might have been affecting people outside of the intended behavior changes. Um, and uh, I will say also, we didn't mention this earlier, but, you know, the program was always framed as a um, healthy relationships uh, type of program rather than as a GBV or IPV program, um, particularly to avoid, you know, stigma and things like that. And, and we know from, you know, previous work and previous guidance that it is uh, better to frame things that way within the community. And so that um, was something our team did as well. Thanks very much, Vandana. So, so I've, I've got a, a question while others were waiting for others. Um, it's something that kind of preoccupies me quite as well because I'm um, sort of an anthropologist by background, but also have you know participated in RCTs and on teams doing RCTs and qualitative research. And one of the things I struggle with a lot is this balance between, I guess, using concepts that are, have meaning and are relevant to the context and people in the context where you're working and then the need to sort of have international comparability to some extent in the way we're doing research. So just to give an example for you and um, the other participants, um, I was doing some research in, in, in Congo in, in DRC a few years ago. Well, it was actually a program around adolescent girls empowerment. And so we did a whole lot of um, formative research to look at well, what does empowerment actually mean in this context? Um, different from the English word empowerment, different from the, the French word autonomisation there. And we try to understand um, in, in Lingala, in the language, you know, what are the concepts around a woman who's strong and autonomous? And we found it was quite a different meaning to um, what it might be in French or English, because actually they're not the same in English and French. So then that affected how we ask questions during research. In that, in that case, it was only qualitative research, the so semi-structured interviews, but I could see the same being pertinent for, for survey-based research, where you're 
asking questions in a language and in concepts which are pertinent to people. So I'm just really interested to hear about that, Vandana. I mean, both in this, you know, this context, but also sort of generally your experience. Like, how do we strike that balance between asking, you know, questions that are internationally comparable that allow us to judge these programs against each other, but also get at that kind of local relevance and mean and, and, and that we don't miss things that are important to people in the in the context where we're working. So I'd be really interested in your your ideas around that. Thanks, Lindsay. That's a challenging question. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, you know, I think I, I think um, one of the reasons that we like to have sort of the formative qualitative research is to help us understand some of the um, ways of thinking about these concepts um, amongst the target population. And I think some, you know, some ideas like that. Uh, came out during uh, the formative research, both in Dolo Addo and also in the um, original communities in rural Ethiopia that helped us really refine our quantitative tools. Um, we also pre-test pre them and kind of pilot the tools and, and try to make sure that we're capturing what we um, aim to be capturing. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there's any real easy answer for that. Um, I think that issue came up as well, even in terms of the content of the program. And, mm -hmm. you know, Samuel mentioned translation being a real challenge uh, in the Somali context. And, you know, I have to say, you know, our adaptation process was probably um, a year in a, a year and a half. Um, and a big bulk of that time was translation because a lot of the concepts did not have exact, you know, translations in uh, Somali language. Um, in addition, a large or a fairly decent proportion of the population um, speaks in, in the camp speak another dialect of Somali called Mai Mai, which is quite different. And so we sort of had to do uh, a couple versions as well in terms of translation, but there were multiple discussions around even just the word gender and, you know, how do you convey, convey that concept in the local language because it wasn't that straightforward. So, um, so I don't know that I have like a, a real um, better answer for you, except that we struggled with it too. Thanks. Yeah. I think it's something really for the field. I mean, what I've experienced is people, doing surveys with a combination of what might be seen as the, you know, the internationally comparable questions translated into the local language which already, already shifts things, as well as sometimes including other questions in there that are more sort of locally pertinent, that's in terms of quantitative. And then also, um, you know, the use of qualitative research, I guess not just to look at the process, but actually in its own right to ask those kind of questions as well. Um, and that, that was my other question actually, Vandana, was whether, as well as the formative research, the qualitative form formative research, did you use qualitative research like throughout the intervention? Like, did you do like longitudinal interviews with a selection of participants, for example, qualitative interviews, or was it mainly for the formative research? Uh, for the Dalo Addo uh, Somali uh, project, we only had qualitative uh, research in the formative phase. Um, it was a pretty small um, project with a short time frame. Uh, but for the Ethiopia RCT, we had qualitative interviews with couples um, at Enline. And so that those data are being analyzed now. But that allowed us to really delve a bit deeper into um, what was happening within the relationships and trying to understand better some of the mechanisms of change. Well, that sounds, well, that sounds like another thing that would be good to have a webinar on at some point <laughs> as well. I think we've had one previously at the collaborative on couples data, looking at qualitative data, mm -hmm. from looking at coupled change processes in IPV prevention programs. So I think that would be super to have you or your colleagues back at some point to, to talk about that. So thanks. Uh, we've just got a few minutes left. And um, Juliana, do we have any hands up? No hands. No hands. Um, I'm trying to see if I had a long list of questions. I don't really want to dominate. Any, anybody else? I'm just going to encourage some last hand putting up from the from participants that are still here. While I look at my my list of questions. Anybody else? Um, I'll ask one final question, then, Vandana. Just take the liberty, and then we'll we'll do a wrap up. I guess it was about um, the specifics of the humanitarian context. You had a really nice slide um, that showed us kind of what are the different risk factors, how are certain risk factors kind of aggravated or more important in this context. And you mentioned things like, 
you know, loss of livelihoods and loss of opportunity. Um, and then that's sort of linked up with substance abuse and poor mental health and, and, and sort of the increased risk factors for IPV. Um, but you were also working in a camp with other programs, as you acknowledge, other programs which were um, looking at GBV response, but also, I guess, distribution programs, the usual programs that happen in camps. So I guess, you know, were, was there any evidence of, of those other programs being risk factors? Because obviously this, this whole issue of how humanitarian aid is distributed, whether it's given to the woman, the man, the household, some can sometimes raise a difference. So do you find any evidence of what was going on in the camp? I mean, you talked about the location of the toilets and you know the, the opportunistic violence that can happen collecting firewood and water, but more in terms of the other programs in the camp, did you find any of those were sort of creating tensions and leading to greater IPV? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the formative research didn't focus so much on, you know, other aid programs and sort of how those might be impacting um, tensions within the household or the family or co broader community. Um, but I know, I mean, we know from other research that, um, you know, humanitarian programming itself can potentially put women and girls at increased risk of violence. And so, um, you know, risk mitigation strategies should be built in uh, to those programs to help minimize and mitigate some of those risks. Um, but as an, you know, as an example, um, I know just informally from conversations that we've had, uh, you know, some women and girls had talked about potential harassment when they're in line for uh, food distribution. Um, and so, uh, you know, certain strategies have been put in place to try to mitigate that, for example, inviting um, certain households on certain days to the, uh, to collect their, um, their food, uh, or having, you know, separate lines for men and women. Um, so, you know, there's different strategies that are in place, um, but it didn't come out so much in our formative research. We were really trying to focus more on, um, IPV in particular, um, and some of the sort of you know, other, other factors, um, Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that's, I just think it's another challenge. Uh, well, I mean, it's saying that there are challenges in all of the contexts, because usually none of us are working, even in regular so called development settings, there often are other programs around. And it's that sort of interaction between those programs, I think sometimes we need to take a take a look at that. So I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Definitely. And, you know, I mean, there are in in the camp we're working in, there was one um, NGO designated to you know, be the lead on GBV um, as well. And so, you know, that organization was running other activities. Um, the focus had not been on IPV. And so, you know, that was recognized as a gap where um, our work could really um, uh, contribute and fill um, some needs in the community. But we were really conscious of that, not wanting to, you know, duplicate existing efforts. Um, I mean, that was actually my final question in the absence of more things in the box was just about that whole thing of, you know, the existing GBV. Um, well, I've got, I'm going to ask one question. I can see Laurie's hand is, is raised as well. But, but in terms of the GBV services, obviously, when we're doing programming and we're doing sort of research as well, we want to be sure that there are, you know, the, those referral pathways are there just in case someone gets triggered during the program or during the research. So did you, were you able to rely on what was there in the camp or did you have to bring in your own counsellors and your own mechanisms as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in the camp, uh, there there were established referral pathways and you know clinics and different things like that resources available. So we were able to link with those um, and and refer our participants when needed and provide a list of the available resources, um, you know, during data collection and so on. In the um, rural communities in Ethiopia, on the other hand there were very few resources um, available. Uh, there were almost, well, f so few that we actually um, hired our own counselor and psychological nurse um, and brought them in, had them trained and embedded within the primary health facilities within uh, the communities where we were uh, conducting the research and the programming to ensure that there was somewhere where not only the participants could access um, resources, but also our staff, um, because, you know, delivering programs like this, um, collecting data also um, could be, could have impacts on um, 
the staff themselves. So wanting to have that safe space for them to um, debrief, to share experiences um, was important. So the, um, the psychological nurses and counselors would have designated sessions with our staff as well on a regular basis to give them that opportunity. Great, thank you. That's really, really helpful. So let's have one last question. I think Laurie's got her hand up. Um, Juliana, are you able to unmute Laurie so she can ask I her? I think question? I'm unmuted, yeah. Oh, you're unmuted. Sorry, Laurie, I can see you. Go All ahead. Right. Um, no, I just, well, just first off, I mean, I think it's, it's always, I think, often the case, just following up on the last one uh, question, I think it's often a case that Ironically, there are better services available uh, and more easily available in humanitarian and uh, refugee settings than you have in kind of non, uh, you know, just community settings, um, which, you know, people always assume it's harder to do this work in those settings, but because there is uh, mechanisms to set up GBV services and, uh, and other types of services, sometimes um, you can rely on them and they're there more in humanitarian settings than in development settings. Um, my, my final comment though was just something that I think as a field, we need to um, think about more, which is, you know, I think this is an example of an incredibly well done and, and write and do, a program in terms of adaptation and informative research and all of that. And there's sort of an expectation um, and a norm within research that these are the various steps that you go through when you are entering a new setting, when you are adapting, when you are you know, doing these kinds of things. I think it's challenging when you're talking about groups that are receiving basically implementation funding as opposed to research funding and yet are expected to be doing the same thing in the sense of starting to implement an, uh, a program, an evidence-based program or some other new program in a new setting. And there is not the norm um, amongst donors and others that you take you know, an upfront period of time to do all the careful work that you've laid out here, Vandana. And, and I think as a community, we need to bring these two settings closer together. Um, I mean, it may be that we can't always do as detailed and, and everything uh, programming like formative research, but there needs to be something and 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 i've been looking a lot to implementation science which is a field that is coming out of people who are in effect accompanying programs as they are being rolled out and and trying to do research along the way to fine tune and to really focus on implementation and I think there's some interesting lessons there. And I just was wondering whether or not you've had any experience with impl implementation research and, and whether or not um, you have any thoughts about the you know, how we can find and create sort of a norm amongst the larger community of the minimum steps and time and that there needs to be accommodation for this type of work in funding that goes to, you know, groups that just start doing actual programming and practitioner groups, as well as to those who are funded through research. That's a complicated question. <laughs> and we and, and Randani, you need to do like a one minute answer because we're over time. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, I'll try to keep it short, but no, I couldn't agree with you more, Lori. Um, I think when we started on this project, uh, like in 2015 for the adaptation, um, we sort of struggled with the lack of guidance out there for really how to do an effective uh, adaptation, sort of how long should it take? What are the right steps? And I think that's one of the reasons why we're undertaking this new project with SVRI around sort of trying to you know, bring colleagues together to really uh, put forward some more clear guidance that could be used um, in exactly the scenarios you described, Lori. Um, so I'm hoping we can have some of those discussions in the next sort of year or so as part of that project as well. 
great. Thank you so much. I think we probably could have gone on a bit a bit longer, but we have um, hit the hit the half past the hour, at least uh, in, in European time here. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, Vandana, thank you so much to you and Samuel, who I thanked in the chat, but we'll we'll follow up with as well. Um, for a super interesting um, webinar. And I think, um, as Laurie just said, actually really showed what is required for adaptation um, in terms of you know, time and resources and careful attention to you know, local language, to piloting, to um, I think that the, the strong emphasis on facilitator training that actually you've had in both programs is also a, a key thing to, to, to emphasize. And also what you've put in place to manage risk, both um, whether it's about providing a counselor in the rural area where there wasn't one, or about you know, this quite careful monitoring of unintended consequences. So it was really, really interesting. So thank you to both of you. I'd encourage participants to, uh, there are a few, um, there are various resources that have been put in the chat um, that you can follow up. We will also send um, an email out um, to everyone who's participated with links to those resources and to the recording. And also um, just to say that, um, there will be a part three webinar in the in the new year um, about this uh, the other adaptation and this kind of um, this, this podcast version of, of UBL as well. Um, so you'll receive some information about that. And otherwise, um, Juliana, do we have a slide to put up about staying connected? Do you have that to show? participant yeah, we're sharing yeah. that now oh you're sharing oh sorry that's because i've got two screens and i've got the right screen on so yeah so just um for those views we do have regular webinars um sometimes monthly sometimes two monthly um so do sign up if you want to and that's also our our social media links and our knowledge platform links on which we have various kinds of um briefs and resources including summaries of programs evidence syntheses both published by the collaborative and by other organizations as well um, and do also email Vandana if you have resources and adaptation to share for the project that she is um, she is doing as well with SVRI. Um, so thanks very much. Um, it was really interesting. Um, thank you for nice for good questions, and thank you again to our two speakers. And hope to see you all soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care.